Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Maggie, and um, as Stephen said, I work for Massey University, and I'm involved with um, the field research that's um, happening through the PGP project and all of that information that is um, getting fed into Manuka Farming New Zealand through that uh, Manuka research, research partnership. So um, I'm here to talk about um, your local population of Manuka and how you can utilize um, what's already there to um, create a plantation. The first place to start is to think about what a Manuka plantation will look like out on the hills. Um, because, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, steep, highly erodible country, um, places that, um, you know, will have a mix of vegetation coverages and what's already there. And when you're looking to create a plantation on this type of area, you know, it's likely there'll be maybe patches of Manuka, patches of gorse, patches of other things that are around. And so there, we wouldn't expect, uh, you know, everywhere in New Zealand to grow perfectly um, uh, formed Manuka, wall to wall, great plantation within five years. You know, we recognize that we're dealing with a natural system, natural ecosystem where, you know, things will probably be a bit patchy um, simply due to abiotic and biotic factors that affect plant growth and all that type of stuff. And so when you're looking at um, what you want to plant, in some cases, you're going to have to step outside of the cultivar range simply because the, the cultivars that are commercially available at this point just simply aren't suitable to all conditions. You know, there there's um, I have four, I believe, that are commercially available now, and of course more coming through the breeding program, but there's more than four types of areas in New Zealand. Like there are, there are areas that are too cold, too, you know, it's, it's, the Monica just simply isn't suited to the soil type. It's too wet, it's too something. So we're looking at um, how we can um, use that local population that is locally adapted and how we can optimize that. And um, kind of the answer is you might already have Manuka, uh, high quality Manuka growing on your land already. And so the, the trick is, is we don't know, we have to find it. And so um, this eco-sourcing step is kind of like the first step in a breeding program where we go out and we test your Manuka. There, there are certain advantages to um, using this local population. You know, it is locally adapted, as, as I said before, to the, the climatic conditions. Um, the, the flowering time is likely to be appropriate for that site. Um, we found out that um, you know, the flowering time um, within the cultivars is quite closely tied to the genetics. So if you're moving a Manuka from the very north of the country further south, it will keep somewhat that early flowering time, and that can be an issue in getting the bees onto the flowers at the right time, if it's too wet, if it's too cold, and the bees just don't fly in very, very early spring, so they can't effectively harvest those trees. So um, ha using your local population, which of course will have a spread of flowering times, you'll be able to um, match the good weather to um, the bees. And of course, um, you have to keep in mind that um, also uh, landowners might be interested in um, keeping their, their products very local. Um, you know, you are, it's something that is becoming more important in terms of uh, the market and what consumers are looking for. They're looking for that local connection and um, uh, the, I guess, the integrity of the production chain, you know, being able to say, yes, this Manuka, you know, it didn't only come from New Zealand, but it's come from the hills of Gisborne or something like that, you know, that has um, value, that has economic value that can be attached. And so, this is about eco-sourcing. It's a very, um, it's a very simple concept. Um, it was originally used as an environmental remediation practice where, you know, they just take seeds from native plants, um, they 
they harvest them and they're grown up and then planted back into the same area. And so what we've done to adapt this into the Manuka, um, into evaluating a Manuka population is um, we've added in this step two, which is essentially the testing of the Manuka. So how it goes is we go out to your site and we um, look at your manuka. We, um, and we select the best trees that we can visually, but we also do a nectar collection. We take the nectar back to the lab and at this point the, the testing that we do is, uh, is only for nectar quality. And that will be looking at the DHA and the sugar value or sugar content. Um, after we do the testing, then we go back and we monitor the seeds. Um, and if there's any additional testing needed, that would be there. Um, four is the seed harvest. Five is we give the seed to the nursery where it's grown up. And then six, of course, is planting it back into your plantation space. And so, of course, when we test the nectar, we at this point are doing a DHA and relative sugar content analysis on that. And that's, um, I'm not sure if you guys are here for Jonathan Stevens' talk, but this is um, essentially how, uh, how a lot of the breeding, or initial breeding decisions were made for the CBT program. So the, the eco-sourcing is really just kind of like an early step, you know, kind of the first steps of a breeding program. Um, of course, the DHA is what's going to give you the high value in your honey. Of course, the higher the DHA in the nectar, that translates to a high DHA in your fresh honey, which of, over time, as the honey matures, converts to the methyl glyoxal, and the methyl glyoxal is the UMF rating. And of course, sugar is what attracts the bees. Um, and also, there, there is a, you know, a, mod, a moderate positive correlation between DHA and sugar. So that's good news. So when we select for one, we're essentially selecting for the other as well. What else do we look at when we look at your trees? We also uh, we look at the flower quality and quantity. There are certain things that we know from our research about the flowers, which um, help us in, make, in selecting the best trees that we can. We look at the health and vigor of the tree. You know, we don't you know, the scientist in me wants to go and kind of test every tree, but in this situation, when you're trying to um, get the best, uh, or the highest pet potential out of your local population, we don't want to, um, we don't want to select from stunted trees, trees that are obviously um, struggling where their neighbors aren't. So uh, we also look at tree structure because um, sometimes the shape of the tree, you know, can help in overall floral density of the area. Um, we look for evidence of high seed production. And um, we do want to get a representative sample of the population to make sure that um, any of the wild areas kind of on your property will be able to um, kind of understand what's coming off of them um, and at least make a more educated guess on the, the honey quality that you'll be getting. There are some risks associated with eco-sourcing. You know, there, there is no guarantee that we will find an amazing tree, you know. Not, it's just simply, not everywhere there is good quality Manuka, but we've had good luck so far. Um, and since uh, we don't have the established seed orchards that are involved with the CVT plant ordering, there may be limited seed production. And also there's a potentially longer time frame, not necessarily, but there are more steps. You know, someone has to go out to the site, they have to do the nectar sampling, testing, they have to go back to harvest the seed. So it's a slightly longer, it may be a slightly longer time frame. Um, and there are other establishment techniques, which I should mention. Um, but these, these assisted natural regeneration and wild regeneration it will certainly grow more of the manuka on your land, but it's not going to be optimizing honey production. These two types, you know, they're usually used in environmental remediation, and honey would 
you know, be a byproduct, and it's likely not to be of the high quality that you would get from establishing a planted Manuka plantation. Um, so there, they exist, but um, I, it just depends on what path you want to take. And if you're looking to do high quality honey, you want to be looking at high quality nectar plants and those are the ones that you'll be getting from the high performance cultivars as well as the ecosource um, trees. And um, basically all of the research that um, we've been working on has really focused on optimizing um, honey production. And so, you know, we, we know a fair amount about the cultivars and about the ecosource and about plantations and we know much less about the other options. And so, what will a Monica plantation actually look like? We know it will be locally adapted where necessary. And where possible, you know, you'll want the to plant the best thing. And so we expect it'll be, you know, a, a mosaic of, of the best Monica you can get. Um, but each site will have, you know, a unique plantation plan, a unique planting plan that is, you know, based on the local opportunities and, you know, on local genetics and how to best optimize those. Um, and we see ecosourcing as really an important um, step in improving our knowledge and um, access to local Manuka genetics, but also as an opportunity to really um, maintain that local connection to, um, to different areas of New Zealand. All right, thank you. That's it.